I'm uh, James Lord. I'm a research scientist here at BRI. I'm also a gastroenterologist across the street, and I have a practice focus in this uh, inflammatory bowel disease, um, which will be partly what I'm talking about, but really some of the goals of my talk today are to give everybody in the room kind of a background on immunology 101. So I'm going to give you all kind of a brief crash course in what these different cells are that Dr. Kita was talking about, um, because the immune system is actually quite complicated. Um, and then talk a little bit about why, as a gastroenterologist, I think that the interface between the, the human GI tract and the immune system is so uh, important and fascinating. And then finally talk about what happens when that interface goes wrong and people develop a dysregulated <coughs> immune system uh, called inflammatory bowel disease. Um, and so the talk I'm giving today is actually a shorter version of a talk that I gave last month for the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation of America. So if anybody wants to hear the expanded version, which is about an hour long, um, I would encourage you to download uh, this particular link uh, at the ccfa.org northwest chapter. It's this one little red line here uh, dated December 3rd that has the same title as my talk, How Does IBD Happen? Understanding the Immune System. Um, and if you uh, can't get this whole note down, there are orange cards for the CCFA Northwest chapter with this website written on them, sitting out uh, by the fire repository kiosk, kiosk just outside the door. I encourage, encourage people to, to grab the card. Um, so when we talk about the immune system, it's, it's not as easy to visualize conceptually what this organ is because it doesn't have an anatomic location the way that your heart does or your liver. You can't picture what an immune system looks like because the immune system is really spread out throughout your body in many different places. But the gastrointestinal tract actually represents one of the largest collections of immune cells in your entire body. And so a big piece of your immune system is your digestive tract. When we talk about the immune system, it's sort of your, your body's defending army. This is how you protect yourself from invaders. It's a collection of cells that are organized uh, and specialized in a hierarchy, much like uh, a, an army would. I don't know, how many people here have ever played Stratego by Milton Bradley? <laughs> so I lifted these off of their, uh, their decals that uh, come on the, the playing pieces. But in that game, there are many different ranks and types of soldiers that have different unique activities, and they also have different hierarchies, where some of them are more powerful than others, um, and much as a, a military would be designed. And so these cells um, have directions that they give each other. There's a lot of communication between them, and there's a lot of specialization, um, so that certain types of cells actually can fight different types of infections. Uh, such as these natural killer cells are an important part of your antiviral immunity. Eosinophils are how people fight off worms. And neutrophils are uh, sort of your basic infantry that uh, fight off bacterial infections. So I'm going to go through this military very quickly and sort of tell you what these different ranks do and a little bit of the basic understanding of how they function. So I put at the top of this hierarchy the dendritic cell as the general of the army because this is really how your immune system samples the outside world to say, is this foreign or not? So dendritic cells are what we call antigen-presenting cells, APCs, and what they do is they will gobble up something foreign, like this bacteria, which we call an antigen. Foreign stuff in immunology term is, terms is called antigen. And they will take that antigen and they'll break it down to little molecular pieces that we call peptides, and then put these peptides back out on their surface in a special molecule that presents them to other immune cells so they can tell that immune cell, look, this is foreign and this is what I want you to do about it. And the cells that really recognize these are called T cells. So Dr. Kita was talking about T cells, different types of T cells in multiple sclerosis. And the T cell is important because every single T cell in your body expresses a different sort of receptor on its surface called a T cell receptor. And there are billions of different T cells in your body with billions of different specificities for billions of different possible foreign peptides. And that's how you can be ready to respond to anything that you've never seen before. Um, so the antigen presenting cell will show the T cell this, and it will drive a bunch of signals inside the cell, which ultimately make the T cell um, respond by maturing, proliferating, and driving an inflammatory response. And one of the medications that we've been using for many decades now to treat these inflammatory responses, prednisone, works right here by blocking NF-kappa B, which is a critical piece of the signal to uh, interfere with the uh, T cell's ability to respond to inflammatory signals. Now, T cells themselves are kind of a broad category. 
that has been divided into many different subgroups, but the major division is between what we call helper and killer T cells. The helpers are CD4, the killers are CD8. And the difference between these is that the CD4s make immune hormones and uh, receptors on their surface that basically direct the immune system. They're like the officers directing the army to, to tell it what to do, how to respond, which cells to bring in. The killer cells, on the other hand, they actually, as the name implies, will kill the cells that they recognize. And so they're an important part of your ability to fight off cancers and cells that get infected with things inside them, like viruses. <coughs> Now, we pay a lot of attention to the CD4s because they are the larger of these two populations and the more diverse. And so many different subtypes of CD4s have been described. Predominantly, there's the TH1s, which directs these types of cells to help fight viruses. The TH2s, which uh, use their own hormones to help these uh, types of cells fight off worm and parasite infections. And then the TH17s that Dr. Makita talked about have been implicated in our ability to recruit neutrophils, which are the, the cells that we use to fight off bacteria. So while these are very important parts of how we fight off infections, when these types of cells get out of control and lose regulation, uh, they can actually attack your own body, and instead of being uh, a war against infections, they end up creating uh, inflammation in, for example, the joints for arthritis the skin for uh, atopic dermatitis, or the gut for Crohn's disease shown here on the colonoscopy picture. Now, interestingly, uh, there are certain hormones that these cells make that have become attractive targets for intervention for treating patients, and uh, probably the dominant one within the past 10 years that has come to the fore as an effective target for therapy is TNF-alpha. This is a hormone that's made by both Th1 and Th17 cells, but not Th2 cells. And so we have drugs now that some of you may have heard of or, or actually tried, like infliximab, which is Remicade, adalimumab, Humira, sertilizumab, Simzia, or golimumab, Symphony, which um, are uh, some of our most effective therapies for treating these conditions. Uh, and then finally, the other uh, type of lymphocyte is called a B cell, which is important for making uh, these soluble molecules. Instead of cells, they're, they're, they're proteins that float around in your bloodstream to attack and fight off uh, germs and uh, different things that can be foreign. And they are critically dependent upon help from the T cells. So there's this interface where they, like the dendritic cells, will ingest something foreign, that antigen, gobble it up, put the peptide on its surface, but when these guys get help from, uh, when they interact with the T cell, the T cell actually tells them what to do rather than the other way around. And uh, as a response, they'll make different types of antibodies that can drive a different type of immune response. And so that antigen interface goes both ways. Both the, the, the cell that samples the environment will tell the T cell what to do, and then the T cell will turn around and tell a different type of cell, a B cell, how to respond. So there's a directorship here and a hierarchy like in a military. Now, there is a balance at play here, though, because um, the immune system can drive either uh, inflammation or not drive inflammation. And how well this is regulated can uh, predispose people to infection, for example, if you have too much regulation of the immune system, or what we call autoimmunity, if there's too much inflammation, not enough regulation. And you can think of autoimmunity sort of like a civil war, because this is when the immune system starts to attack its own host. And there are many different types of uh, autoimmune diseases, uh, many of which are studied here at BRI. My little piece of this puzzle is the inflammatory bowel diseases highlighted in red, ulcerative colitis, and Crohn's disease. Now, there are many safety checks that regulate the immune system, this balance between inflammation and regulation. For one, you can actually delete self-reactive cells, uh, like Benedict Arnold here. You can get rid of uh, parts of the military that are uh, potentially treacherous and treasonous. Uh, and get rid of them before they go out and cause trouble. There are also uh, special molecules the immune system can make to inhibit a response. And finally, there are these cells that Dr. Keita mentioned, regulatory cells, which are sort of like the military police. They're parts of the immune system that regulates other parts of the immune system to stop it from overreacting. And one of the most, uh, one of the best described and most important of these is what she mentioned, the regulatory T cell. Now, these represent a very small part of those CD4 positive cells that I talked about, um, but they are different from other cells. Whereas most of your CD4s, that can be differentiated because most of your CD4s don't express something called FOXP3, whereas your regulatory T cells do, 
when most of your T cells get activated by that antigen presenting cell, they'll make uh, these signals that drive inflammation and they'll make lots of copies of themselves. But when a regulatory T cell gets activated by an antigen presenting cell, it will come in contact with the other cells and stop them from doing these things. And a lot of the work that was done to explore the nature of these cells and describe them for the first time was done by our own Steve Ziegler, who you uh, saw in that movie talking earlier, and who was uh, uh, my former mentor who got me interested in studying uh, the immune system in the GI tract. Now, interestingly, at the same time as Dr. Ziegler was describing these cells here in Seattle, there was another condition um, on the clinical side. There were some children who were showing up with mutations in this FOXP3 gene that I mentioned, that resulted in severe inflammation, including gut inflammation, looking like extremely severe inflammatory bowel disease. And a lot of this work has now been taken on by Troy Torgerson, who's a, an active collaborator with the Benaroy Research Institute, um, based out of Seattle Children's Hospital. We've had a lot of um, collaborations with Troy Torgerson to, to understand uh, how regulatory T cell defects uh, can lead to immune dysregulation. Fortunately, we also are in the same city as the Hutch, and so the only cure for this IPEX condition is stem cell transplant, which was also invented in Seattle. Um, now, uh, one of the first things I did in Dr. Ziegler's lab was explore regulatory T cells in inflammatory bowel disease, and it's not as simple as IPEX. These cells are not simply missing in inflammatory bowel disease. You can see patients with ulcerative colitis and Crohn's have at least as many regulatory T cells in their colon and in their blood uh, compared to uh, patients who do not have inflammatory bowel disease. So there's something wrong in terms of why these cells are not working. They're there, but they can't regulate. And so a lot of the work we're doing now is to try and solve this paradox, how you can actually have more regulatory T cells and yet have active inflammation. And so that's a lot of the work that I've been engaged in here at BRI. Um, so to sort of finalize my um, Immunology 101 uh, lecture, I'd like to give you a different way to think about the immune system, is that it can be divided up into two major arms, what we call the adaptive immune system, which is made mostly of those T and B cells I mentioned. This relies on random chance and selection, so your immune system basically develops by chance, but then it gets heavily selected to be useful to you. And this is it, and consequently, it's able to learn from its environment and remember what it's seen in the past. So vaccines are really important for educating your adaptive immune system. But at the same time, uh, there is something called an innate immune system, which is basically all of the rest of those immune cells, more of the foot soldiers of the military. Um, and these are fixed and non-random. They're all exactly alike, and they're totally incapable of memory. So whereas vertebrates have developed this complex adaptive immune system, the innate immune system is uh, what invertebrates and plants actually have to defend themselves from infection. So now I'm going to change gears a little bit and tell you about why I think the GI tract is so interesting. So the gastrointestinal tract is a somewhat unique immunologic challenge because the digestive tract's role is to serve as a portal for foreign things to get into your body. Uh, you remember the saying, you are what you eat. So when we ingest something foreign, we have to have a way to get nutrients inside our body and nutrients are necessarily uh, foreign. They contain a lot of proteins and other molecules that your body may have never seen before. Um, but at the same time, the gut is one of the dirtiest places on earth and it's full of bacteria and pathogens <laughs> that could potentially invade your castle. And so you have to somehow have this portal that will let nutrients in and yet keep all the bad guys out. Because all these bacteria that live in your gut, if any of them were to get into your bloodstream, they could kill you. And so your immune system has to somehow defend this border. So think of the gut mucosa as a wall. Outside the wall, you have viruses and parasites, but you also have 100 trillion bacteria. That's 10 times as many cells as you have in your body. There are both uh, bad pathogens, which can cause infections, but there are also these good symbionts that are necessary for part of your digestion. If you were to eliminate all the bacteria in your gut, you would not be able to digest food. We've co-evolved with them. They're necessary for us. Plus, of course, the food you eat is foreign. You don't want to react to that. And then inside the wall, we have this rich blood supply, what are called lymphatics, that are sort of the, the passageways that the immune system moves through, and many, many immune cells. So the gut, is, as I mentioned, is actually the largest collection of immune cells in the entire body. So you have these two diametrically opposed forces, one that's really driving inflammation, the other one that could potentially cause an infection. So do we have some sort of a huge castle wall keeping them across, away from each other, or maybe some tiny, tiny bottleneck that prevents them from interfacing? No. What we have is a wall that's 100 square meters in surface area. So in order to absorb all those nutrients, we have a surface area in our gut the size of a tennis court. 
And it's separating these two forces. This big, huge area of potential interaction is separated by a cell wall that is one cell thick. There's only one cell standing between this immune system and all these bacteria. So the amazing thing to me is not that IBD doesn't happen. The amazing thing is that we don't all have IBD all the time. <laughs> so if you think of the gut mucosa as a wall, you can actually kind of visualize this. Um, with, uh, I think this is from Peter Jackson's movie. Um, <laughs> But uh, it actually looks kind of like a wall on cross-section, whoops, where you see these, uh, these uh, bastions of, of immune cells clustering like, like army barracks behind this wall that's only a single cell thick here, separating this dense collection of immune cells from all these bacteria outside. Um, and it's, it's not only that the wall could potentially break down and let some of these bacteria cross, the immune, cell actual, the immune system actively samples what's outside it all the time. Those dendritic cells I told you about are actually reaching across this wall to grab hold of bacteria and those other antigens out there and bring them back and sample them, just say, okay, what's going on outside the wall at any given time? And there's actually a very complicated uh, trafficking and interplay that occurs where these dendritic cells DCs or SEDs here, that pull in the antigens from the outside, they will actually go into those lymphatic channels that I told you about and go back to what are called lymph nodes, little lumps of, of immune tissue at the base of your bowel that are uh, like the headquarters for your immune system. Now while those uh, uh, dendritic cells are sitting there, other immune cells, naive cells that have never seen something foreign before, will float by, interact with them, and they will say, hey, you. This is what I saw. If you recognize this, I want you to turn into somebody who can drive this sort of immune response, and then they imprint them with an address, a trafficking address, that'll tell them, then I want you to get back in the bloodstream and go back to the bowel. And so these cells leave the, the lymph node, they go out traffic ground, and ultimately end up back at the immune system to drive an immune response. And knowing that there's this commute that happens with your immune cells between the, the bowel, the lymph node, the blood, back to the bowel, going round and round like people getting on and off I-5. Um, we've discovered that this is actually a very effective place to interact with the immune system to try and treat people with inflammatory bowel disease. One of the newest strategies we now have is what are called anti-integrant therapies. These block immune cell trafficking uh, to the gut or actually in multiple sclerosis to the brain as well. Um, and so there are molecules um, that interact with each other, that basically let the immune cell grab onto the blood vessel. It's a cross-section of a blood vessel, like a pipe. And this is a T cell that's latching onto it, and then once it's latched on, it can climb out into, under the, the, the wall there and set up this inflammatory response. And um, one of the drugs that can block this interaction, Tysabri, which is used in both multiple sclerosis and inflammatory bowel disease, uh, the, the work that was done to gain FDA approval for Crohn's disease, uh, one of the lead recruiters was actually Richard Kazarek at the Virginia Mason Gastroenterology Division across the street. Um, and so <clears throat> there's, a phase, there's, a, there's sort of a, a version two of this that came out just in uh, May of last year called Entibio, or Vitalizumab which is even more selective for the gut. Unfortunately, it won't work for multiple sclerosis, but it's a very bowel-specific version of this that works uh, in ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease and has really started to uh, change the way that we treat inflammatory bowel disease because it's a very gut-specific immunosuppressant. It will block the immune cell trafficking into the gut, but it'll leave your immune system completely alone everywhere else in your body, so it won't increase your risk of skin infection, pneumonia, anything else. It's a much more selective way of altering uh, the immune system than uh, some of these other me mechanisms that we've used. And so I'm, I currently have a grant to uh, study what the effect of Intibio is at the, the bowel in our patients who are receiving it. So uh, the gut mucosal immune system um, has a difficult job. It has to discriminate between things it needs to attack and things it needs to ignore. But what happens if it doesn't? So that's what we're talking about as inflammatory bowel disease, as really two diseases, ulcerative colitis and Crohn's, which are differentiated largely based upon anatomy. Ulcerative colitis um, always starts at the anus and moves approximately some amount through the colon, could be just a little bit, could be the whole colon, but it never goes past the colon. It's always restricted to the colon, and it's always limited to the lining of the colon called the mucosa. It doesn't go through the wall. Whereas Crohn's disease can do whatever it wants. It can show up anywhere in the GI tract, but usually in the colon in the last part of the small bowel called the terminal ileum. And its inflammation can be limited to the wall, but it can also go through the wall and cause these inflammatory holes called fistulas. 
Um, if those holes get sealed off, they can become abscesses. And that inflammation can actually narrow the walls of the bowel and cause strictures uh, and bowel obstructions that can require surgery to fix them. So much as Dr. Kita was asking the question, what causes multiple sclerosis? I have a very similar slide about what causes IDD. And of course, the answer is we don't entirely know. But we do know that it's a combination of genetics, immunology, and microbiology. So the genes you inherited from your parents, what your immune system is doing, and then the bacteria that live in your gut are all known to play some sort of an important role. And the genetics part of this um, has uh, really uh, expanded dramatically over the past decade. Um, and uh, Dr. Sarah Soletti will be up shortly to uh, talk to you about uh, the role of genetics, both in IDD and other immune system uh, disorders. But in inflammatory bowel disease, you can see that there are genes that ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease are associated with, um, and then in, uh, inflammatory bowel disease in general, many of which are uh, under study here at the Benaroy Research Institute uh, through Dr. Sarsoletti. Um, it's a very complicated story, but the take-home points are that the immune system has shown many genes uh, uh, linked to inflammatory bowel disease. And a lot of these genes are involved with recognizing the bacteria in the gut. And so this supports the concept that IBD is caused by a dysregulated interaction between the immune system and what we call the microbiome, the total collection of bacteria that live in your gut. And we know that the microbiome in patients with inflammatory bowel disease is different. This is a complex ecology. That's 100 trillion different bacteria, and there are thousands of different species involved in it. And so it's currently under intense investigation, and many differences have been observed between IBD patients and controls, which are sort of summarily graph uh, depicted graphically here. Um, but it's very difficult to tease out cause and effect in inflammatory bowel disease. We don't know if these changes are what's driving the inflammation or whether the inflammation is driving these changes. Um, but it has led an interest to seeing whether changing our microbiome can cure inflammatory bowel disease. There's something called fecal microbiome transplant, or a boop transplant, where you literally put somebody else's fecal bacteria into the colon of a person who's sick. And this has worked extremely well for an infection called Clostridium difficile. And so people have tried it in inflammatory bowel disease. Unfortunately, in adult ulcerative colitis, there have been a couple of trials done so far, one of them over at the University of Washington, um, that have been fairly disappointing. Uh, not only doesn't it work, but the patients seem to transiently get a little sicker. Part of the problem is that the microbiome goes right back where it started within a couple of weeks. So unless we do this all the time, it doesn't seem like it would ever work. Um, now, there has been some early experience in pediatric Crohn's disease through David Suskind over at Seattle Children's Hospital that suggests that maybe in younger patients, it may take root a little bit better. Um, but uh, it, uh, that data is still extremely preliminary. So a more focused approach is trying to replace just a little piece of the microbiome, or at least use a microbe to drive a change in the inflammatory response. There is a worm called Trichuris suis, which infects pigs, but it won't infect humans. Every single person, every single human will clear a worm within less than two weeks, so it is not a human infection. But it may alter the immune response in the gut. Um, it may push T cells from that pathogenic Th1 or Th2, Th17 type response I mentioned over towards something like a, a Treg or a Th2 response, which is more protective. And what I have seen is that there are low rates of IBD in countries with high rates of worm infections, and actually pig farmers in the American North, uh, the, sorry, American Midwest have also been noted to have a very low incidence of inflammatory bowel disease. So it suggests that simply being associated with pigs may be good for you in terms of preventing <laughs> So um, uh, Joel Weinstock's group actually had published um, almost, yeah, about a decade ago um, a, a randomized trial showing that in ulcerative colitis, uh, consuming these pig whipworms could actually help you, that uh, compared to placebo, there was some improvement uh, both in remission and response. And you can see that the activity score of disease uh, dropped significantly more in the patients who got the worm than those who didn't. Oops, typo. Um, <laughs> And so currently, there's an NIH-funded trial to look at this uh, more scientifically and more exhaustively. And uh, currently, we are uh, uh, with Michael Kiorian, uh, one of the, the principal investigators across the street at Virginia Mason Gastroenterology. We have a clinical trial for uh, studying um, the ability of these big worms to alter the inflammatory response in ulcerative colitis. And so if you happen to have left-sided ulcerative colitis, um, 
then you may want to contact Jody Mooney, whose email is here, and she's the coordinator uh, who can talk to you more about what this trial is. Or I would encourage everyone to just go to www.clinicaltrials.gov. It is really the um, United States uh, repository of all of the uh, patient clinical trials that are currently registered. Um, so, in conclusion, my take-home points is that the immune system is complicated, hierarchical, and dynamic. The gut is a complex immunology paradox because it has to let in nutrients from outside while keeping out germs. And in terms of how IBD happens, I guess this was a bit of false advertising in the title because we don't really know, but it's most likely a loss of immune tolerance to normal gut microbes facilitated by key genes that Dr. Saracoletti will talk about in a moment. And we treat it with immunosuppression at present. Um, but our goal is to try and come up with more targeted therapies to more safely alter the uh, immune system or potentially cure this disease, this pair of diseases. So, I guess I can take questions now? You can take questions, yeah. Yes, ma'am. Is there any correlation or um, higher increase of seeing patients, let's say, with MS that also come to you and have like ulcerative colitis? There is a modest association between several immune uh, disorders and inflammatory bowel disease. Um, it's, it's very slight, it's, it's not powerful, so it doesn't necessarily mean that if you have an inflammatory bowel disease, you will definitely get another autoimmune disease, uh, but it's a little higher than the background population. Um, there are a couple of diseases where it is extremely associated, mostly of the liver. So there's a, a condition called sclerosing cholangitis, where if you have IBD, you have about a 5% chance of getting sclerosing cholangitis. What's more interesting is that if you have sclerosing cholangitis, you have about a 75 or 80 percent chance of getting IBD. That's the strongest correlation that I'm aware of. Um, the other ones are much more subtle. Well, right. Well, thank you so much. Um, oh, yeah. Any connection or correlation between antibiotic use in children and then coming up with problems in adult life related to colon and all of this. In, in our society, we use a lot of antibiotics on mm -hmm. kids. It and seems like that would be a really obvious correlation, but it's a little hard to tease out. I think that's part of the hygiene hypothesis, that in general there's less microbial exposure. And whether that's because of better hygiene and sanitation, increased use of um, antibiotics, uh, cleaner food or more processed food, um, we don't really know. But there is this working hypothesis that the reason we're seeing so many more inflammatory, autoimmune, and allergic type diseases is because the immune system is not encountering all of the microbes that we're normally used to uh, interacting with, that we were evolved to fight. And it's sort of like the saying, idle hands are the devil's playthings. If you don't give the immune system something to work on, it'll work on you. <laughs> <laughs>